at reporter Chris on Twitter. Chris Johnson from Soji. Chris, how are you? Good, sir. I am fired up after uh, hearing the tail end there of your soliloquy on the Olympics. <laughs> I, I I shared many of your sentiments, so I, I enjoyed that. So, do you, like, you're there. Is does it feel like? Because it felt like, and I'll give Elliot Friedman uh, full credit. And I don't like doing that, but he said the narrative going into every Olympics is always all the bad, and once the Olympics start, we start seeing all the good. Are we, even in Sochi, where the journalists seem to make a a um, <laughs> make a sport or at least a game out of whining has that kind of subsided a little bit and it's kind of the focus is turned to i hope so i mean i i think a lot of the complaining was was borderline pathetic myself i mean i i i just don't think that that maybe some of my colleagues are as well traveled or or whatever and i'm not that's not to say that there weren't problems it just i think it reached a level or a pitch that was a little bit much, uh, but you're right. Now that the, the games are being played, medals are being won, you know, things are happening. That that certainly doesn't seem to be uh, the wider conversation or even the one that I'm hearing many of my colleagues talk about here. Uh, all right, so the uh, the Canadian Olympic team hits the ice, and I don't know if, if you realize the shock waves that seeing people skating with other people caused on this side <laughs> of the Atlantic, but my dear God, Chris... It was like they had they had announced on on the top of a mountain who was going to play with whom, and that was stuck until the end of these games. Well, it, it, and that's the funny thing that this year it's it's different than the past Olympics in that you're going to have a forward and defenseman scratched as well. So that kind of adds a new wrinkle, if you will, to to that sort of uh, reaction, I guess. And you know, any team that can have John Tavares as its fourth line center, as Team Canada does, you know, as we sit here right now. Uh, it's obviously a pretty good hockey team, and I guess that's what fuels a lot of that uh, debate and passion and thoughts from 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 the fans. And you know, today at practice here in Sochi, we we really saw clear line rushes, and you know, it's a window window to what Mike Babcock and the coaching staff are thinking uh, at the start of these games. You know, I would would put the asterisk on there that I am certain a hundred percent that we will see four different lines in the last game Canada plays than they have right now just because of the amount of juggling that, that has to go on uh, as the team sort of finds its identity and, and, and tries to build. Well, the best part already is that day one, it seemed like it was Getzlaff, Perry, and Tavares. And now Tavares seems like he is now the fourth line center. And that experiment yeah. on the left wing is done in a day, even though people were freaking out about it. Yeah, I mean, it's some of it, I think, was was out of the fact that, that Team Canada didn't really do, uh, you know, anything approximating true line rushes right. uh, in the first practice they had here. So, so some of that, you know, and I think I contributed to it. I believe I tweeted that, uh, you know, were you know was sort of just a misunderstanding. I, I believe I don't I don't think that there was necessarily a thought a change in thought from the coaching staff. Uh, but it's pretty clear right now. I mean, it, it's going to come down in terms of the choice of who who gets scratched uh, as up front between Martin Saint Louis. Uh, and Matthew Shane, and on defense is Dan Hamhuis and PK Subban. They'll be they'll be choosing between. And for example, that that was something after the first skate. I, I didn't, you know, wasn't wasn't very clear in the way they, they they held that skate. Right. Has there been any tip on the goaltending situation, or has it kind of been status quo from Mike Babcock and company? Very very status quo. You know, uh, Roberto Luongo was saying today that uh, he doesn't have any idea, and he said it in a way that uh, at least he's, he's either got a good good poker face. Well, he's, or he's, lying. he's got some experience uh, though in this uh, in this regard, doesn't he? He does. He does. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I really was left with a sense. Even even actually, I had a good chat with Matt Shane just about his status, and he said that that no roles or anything like that had, had been disclosed. You know, by that point, which was you know about six or seven hours ago here in Sochi. But, you know, I do think that, that, that you know, there's a lot still up in the air. I mean, yeah. we know that Mike Babcock wants to, to have both guys uh, split those games, uh, Price and Luongo. Uh, I would think that, that Luongo gets the, the first start against Austria, uh, leaving, uh, sorry, against Norway, and then leaving Price to play Austria on Friday. You know, that's, that's my sense of how it'll go. But certainly nothing has been confirmed uh, from either the players or the coaching staff. And uh, after day one, it seemed like P.K. Subban and Dan Hughes were kind of the spares on the defensive side of things. Still feel that way? Yeah, you know, and, and I kind of wonder if maybe P.K. is going to find himself sitting out 
uh, that first game. Uh, you know, a lot of talk uh, from from the Team Canada staff about the fact that the defense is the hardest thing they think uh, for the players to adapt to when when they're not uh, when they just first arrived here and and they're getting comfortable and trying to figure out the system. That that I think that the, the belief is that with the offensive skill. Uh, all these players possess, so they're able to kind of fudge their way at, the, at that end of the ice. And mm-hmm. I just wonder when when you look at that that choice, if that's you know maybe a window into their thinking when they have to make that decision with, with Ham Hughes uh, or PK Subban. I, I sort of see Ham Hughes as, as a natural that can maybe sub in uh, and take Mark Edward Vlasic's spot uh, in the lineup alongside Drew Doughty, uh, you know, if if necessary. And and you know, it, it sort of just kind of reading the tea leaves. And, you know, Marty Samalee being the last guy in the door on this team, I, you know, would be my guess uh, of who is scratched, uh, which might surprise some people. I know we talked a few days ago when he was first named to the team, and I, I do think he has a chance because the, the right wing is, is an area that, that I think, you know, there, there's some flexibility there for Canada. I could see Samalee moving up the lineup eventually, but he might start his Olympics watching uh, from the stands. So is that the feeling right now, Mark Edward Vlasic, don't screw up because there's two guys waiting to take your spot? Like He's the guy that if well, he gives the puck away against Norway, he's out? Maybe. You know, the, the one guy I actually target is Chris Kunitz, you know, who's going to start on the, on the first, uh, obviously alongside Sidney Crosby on the first line on the left side and also on the top power play unit. You know, I think John Tavares is a natural to be moved back to the left wing up there. You know, if Kunitz, for whatever reason, shows he, he can't handle it or... Or, you know, if they don't like the, the look of that line in general, you know, I could see, you know, Kunitz even being dropped potentially to play with Perry and Getzlaff because that, that was a line at one point in Anaheim uh, when those three guys were together. And I, and I could see, you know, Tavares working his way up in this lineup because, you know, while he starts as a fourth line center today, you know, I think if you if you look at the skill set of the players, uh, you know, he's not a fourth line type of guy. And, and I think that they'll they'll decide, you know, if they need more out of the team, that, that he's someone that they can better utilize uh, moving forward. Chris Johnson, at Reporter Chris on Twitter, joining us from Sochi, where he is covering uh, mainly the, the hockey side of things. Um, the other question I have is, is simply, it seems to me like all of Canada is expecting that once the playoff round or the medal round gets going, even the second round, that Carey Price will be the goaltender. It is it is it going to be an honest to goodness one for one, and then we'll decide. Because I think people, at least in this market, Chris, watch the Jonathan Bernier and James Reimer thing transpire. Yeah, thinking the whole time Bernier is really the number one. They don't have to say it. So if Reimer steals it, good on James Reimer. But we know he's getting paid more. And they just traded for him, so they probably like Bernier more. I look at the numbers over the last few games. Carey Price has been lights out, and Roberto Luongo left the lights on and nobody's been home. Yeah, it, it, what I love about Canada, actually, is that the, this debate has been raging for about two years uh, <laughs> yeah. before getting here, and that it, it's still it's still at the same pitch. I mean, right. Right, we, we've been fretting about the goaltending for right. a long, long time heading into these games. And I would sort of have the belief, to be honest, that, that maybe one guy would have totally separated himself uh, by the time this tournament came around. That that was back then. That was my thinking. And it, it hasn't truly happened. I mean, you're right. Price has had, uh, in particular, the last month or so, uh, the better season than, than the long go. Uh, but he hasn't, you know, accomplished quite as much in his career. He's obviously a younger player. Right, I guess. So I think that that is kind of the crux of this, the decision that, that has to be made here. Uh, but, you know, I don't. I, I honestly, I would be spec. I, I don't have a true feel on on how Team Canada feels about this. I, I actually do think it might be a little bit up for grabs here, and, and that's what's kind of makes it tough that they start with Norway and Austria, right. even Finland uh, in the third game, which is a tough game to win. But the Finns aren't the type of team that's going to put eight by your goalie or right. six, or you know, I mean, it's going to yep. be a one nothing type of two one game. So I'm not sure unless guys are letting them in from center ice uh, on either side you know, how much of an evaluation you're going to get from these opening three games. And then once you get beyond that, you have to win every game the rest of the tournament to win gold. So I, I do think that the goaltending decision uh, is probably the most interesting one to monitor. The You know, it's sort of, it, it will define in part the, the success or not that the team has. And, and I don't think it's a clear-cut decision either way. It, it's going to have to be a gut feel. And, 
you know, as a result, I do think there's a chance Luongo is the guy more than Price just because of the comfort level they have with them and the fact that they've won with them. And, mm-hmm. you know, I know what the, I've, you know, I've been around for all these years. I know what the debate is about his, his shortcomings, but, you know, he's done it for Canada in the past and that might, that might help him out in the situation. Well, a lot of the guys that made the team that were, you know, um, quote unquote on the bubble were guys that had shown up for Canada before. It seems like that comfortability is, is a big part of what's going on. Hey, does it, you, you mentioned the um, Norway, uh, Austria, and Finland, and then I look at, you know, Group A, Russia, USA, Slovakia, and I'm going to give some props to Slovenia because I just told them to suck it about 10 minutes ago uh, based on the medal standings. But th- yeah. th- th- you think that's a benefit for Canada or in a short tournament like this, might it be good to be in... The, you know, the so-called group of death early where you get some tests like Russia, the United States, and Slovakia? I think beyond the goaltending discussion that we just had, I do think it's a benefit because, you know, presumably it gives Canada a better chance to, to finish with a high seed. Mm-hmm. You know, you would you would think even probably the first seed, and that sets up an easier quarterfinal match. You know, and that's the most dangerous and scary game at this tournament for any team because if you lose that one, you go home and it feels too soon and, and, and the tournament's labeled a disaster. Whereas if you get, you know, beyond it, you know, while Canada certainly wouldn't accept bronze or silver, you, you've got a real chance to at least come home with a medal and, and you think, well, you know, it wasn't quite what we wanted, but it wasn't so bad. Uh, so I do think it is a benefit in, in the big picture. I mean, even look tomorrow night uh, when, when the tournament begins, it's, it's Czechs and Sweden right out of the box. You know, and that's that's two of the teams that, that can reasonably, you know, if, if the right things fall their way, I don't think we'd be totally surprised to see either of them win. You know, it, that, that's tough. You know, I, I think I think that Canada, you know, especially given the the challenge of, of getting together, there's they're a team out of any of the team where you out of any of the other teams here that have the fewest guys that, that play together regularly or play together in the past. You know, I think most of these national teams. Oh, there's a lot more familiarity built in uh, when they come to them. Whereas, you know, you get a guy like Patrick Sharp, for example, I chatted with earlier today, and, and he's, you know, he says he doesn't know half the guys, you know, because he hasn't played on a tremendous amount of teams like this in the past. So right. I think that having those easier games, and that's not meant to dis- disrespect those countries, I think it helps Canada form an identity at the event. And, and as I said, they'll, they'll probably get easier quarterfinal as a result. Uh, you're there, I'm not. Anything else that we need to know about the, the hockey tournament? Well, I'm I'm glad it's going to start finally uh, <laughs> yeah. tomorrow. It feels like there's been a lot of a lot That's of buildup, you know, and, and you know, for months and and even in, in the days I've been here, you know, it's 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 a fascinating event though. It really is. It's so cool to see all these NHL stars here, uh, you know, wearing their wearing their their national colors. How important it is to them. I mean, I know that the wider discussion too is about. Young Chang is just the last go around. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could ask any of these guys that the players themselves that get to play in this thing, they're like kids. They really are. I, you know, some guys I deal with a lot in the NHL I've seen here. It's like I haven't seen them smile this much in months. And I, I do think there's a sort of joyful feeling to being around the Olympics and being at this event and, and having a chance to score a goal potentially that people in your country will talk about for 50 years, depending on the circumstances and the situation. I think just sort of the, the, the scope of this thing is, is impressive and, you know, there's a lot of excitement here. So I think now that the games are going to begin, it's going to go quickly. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very interested to see who comes out on top. I think there's five or six teams that reasonably could, could win. Uh, and that makes it interesting. It's a bit of a roll of the dice when you get into those single game eliminations. And it's kind of to the point that I was making earlier where um, the idea of the IOC and its ridiculous scam on having the NHL players boost up their ratings uh, three, four, five fold for this tournament just disappears and we start talking hockey and the guys, you know, obviously want to be there. It harkens back to their youth. They got a tournament. They're sleeping in the same room as they're, you know, it's like that they're at the Motel 6 in uh, in uh, in Huntsville, Ontario. Yeah, and do you know what I think really stands out for them, though, is they feel part of the wider Team Canada, for example. You know, yeah. uh, last night I know that they were at the Athletes' Village and, and a few of the athletes that had won medals uh, came back from their events with the medals, and it sounds like there's a whole sort of ceremony among the athletes. And yeah, I think they feel part of something bigger and different. And, and you know, I think patriotism is something that, that, you know, Canadians don't like to necessarily wear on their sleeve all the time. But when you get to an event like this, uh, people it just remind you how proud you are to be where you're from and, and sort of a chance to do something lasting, as I, as I mentioned. I mean, I think, you know, I, I cover hockey all the time, uh, Tim. But, but, you know, I think people might remember that Chicago won the Stanley Cup last year, but they might forget who scored the goals. Whereas, 
You know, right. I, when Team Canada does something, it, it sort of lasts forever. It gives these players a chance to, to make kind of a, a memory, a, a chance to make more of an impression than even in their pro careers where that pay them millions of dollars and have made them famous that they don't have the chance to achieve. And, you know, that, that's kind of part of the fun of this thing for these guys. And, and it does stand out. And, and I know they're going to fight hard to be back here in four years and four years beyond that because, you know, it, it, the deeper we get into this, the more kids that grew up dreaming of it, the, the, the better the narrative is. You know, it, it's it's more important with each passing one. You know, it's funny you say that, and I, I was thinking about this earlier, and I almost, it's it's something that unites us unlike anything else. And I know that's kind of the over, it, it's kind of the overused cliche, but if you really think about it, I would hazard to guess that most Canadian fans of an NHL team wouldn't mind their best player being hurt if it meant they won gold in, in for I Canada. Know by that. Yeah. And and I, we know I how much Canadians that. love their 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 club teams, but I'm just saying the love for Canada is almost that great that they wouldn't mind seeing their best player hurt if it meant Canada won gold and they got to celebrate in the streets as they did four years ago. Well and and how often do we get a barometer to test our pride? You know, yeah. like to truly <laughs> test it. I mean I think in Canada I think rarely with the success of the World Junior Tournament, I think that there's an element of that, but this is something deeper and more meaningful. And when it comes to hockey, you know, it's the one time that, that Canadians aren't shy. It's the one sport where we're not afraid to, to even puff out our chests and, and, and say we're the best at. And and this is the only time you can really truly tr- prove it, where every country has its best players. It's a level playing field, so to speak. You, you start and, and you, you play the games and see. And I just think that the, the lack of those opportunities, you know, it makes this more meaningful in many ways because, you know, we wait four years, uh, you know, to see what's going to happen. And, and then it comes down to six games and it really actually comes down to about two or three games starting at that quarterfinal. And, you know, we all know that the good part about hockey is, is when things go well, but it doesn't take much for them to go wrong. And, you know, I just, all that, that element is just, it's, it's fascinating to me. And, and I think it's what makes this tournament special. Uh, Christopher, I always enjoy our conversations. Thanks. Thank you, and uh, have a good show there. I'll try my best. I can't guarantee anything, but I'll try my best. I know Sid's not around. Yeah. It's hard to do the Tim and Sid show with, you know, solo, so. Damn herpes. Thanks, Chris.